ABC News Live. There was a lot of yelling, and I don't know if that was him or if that was other patrons yelling about him. It was a, a lot of loud bangs. Heartache and hate, the gripping stories from survivors like Wyatt Kent, whose boyfriend was killed at Club Q in Colorado Springs. After a gunman opened fire inside the LGBTQ nightclub, five are dead, many more injured. Tonight, we are learning about the suspect and the charges he could face. New details in the murder mystery in Idaho after four college students were found fatally stabbed in their off-campus home. What authorities have revealed about the 911 call that came in from one of the roommates who survived and what happened before that call came in. The war in Ukraine and growing concerns about the threat of nuclear disaster as Russia fires rockets toward the Zaporizhia power plant and steps up attacks on the power grid as winter cold sets in. The big dig after a record snowfall buried some with six feet of snow, more than 80 inches near Buffalo. Now temperatures plunging from coast to coast as millions head home for Thanksgiving. The whole world is watching as the World Cup opens in Qatar. The controversy is already surrounding one of the world's biggest sporting events from allegations of bribery and human rights violations to the culture clash in the Arab nation, including questions about whether everyone is truly welcome. The landmark legal battle. We take a closer look at a major Supreme Court case involving Native American children and adoption and a challenge to a law that for more than four decades has given preference to Native families. And our interview with actress Michelle Monaghan about her new horror film, Nanny, which won praise at Sundance, why the story pushed the star out of her comfort zone. I would say that it made me very uncomfortable. Um, in the most perfect way. And, and as an actor, I wanted to lean into um, that discomfort. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are starting off the show tonight with a storyline that has become all too familiar in this country, with the pain and anguish from yet another mass shooting. Same heartbreak, just a different community, this time in Colorado Springs. We're starting to learn more about the five lives lost over the weekend and the brave heroes who prevented this tragedy from becoming far worse. The gunman's rampage inside an LGBTQ nightclub Saturday left five people dead and at least 19 others injured, all before two people stepped up and risked their own lives to take him down. By the time police arrived, the gunman had been subdued. For more than two decades, Club Q had served as a safe haven for all ages of the LGBTQ community there. Late today, police identified the five victims in tonight we remember who they were and what they meant to those who love them. 28-year-old Daniel Davis Aston, a bartender at Club Q. His mom still called him her baby. 40-year-old Kelly Loving, her sister described her as always fighting for people and so kind. 38-year-old Derek Rump, his family told ABC News he had a heart of gold and was living his dream. Raymond Green Vance, his grieving girlfriend posted to Facebook today calling him the brightest light and said in his arms, were the only place she ever felt safe. 35-year-old Ashley Paw, her family called her a compassionate woman who put her all into being a mother, a mother and a wife. Tonight, the suspect is facing preliminary murder and hate crime charges. We're learning more about a prior arrest. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, leads us off tonight from Colorado Springs. Tonight, for the first time, we're seeing video showing the suspected Colorado mass shooter surrendering to police during an arrest last year for allegedly making bomb threats against his own mother. Anderson Lee Aldrich seen with his hands up, taken into custody and charged with menacing and kidnapping. In live stream video, now deleted, you can see the suspect wearing body armor before that arrest and hear him making threats. If they breach, I'm going to blow it to holy hell. So, uh... Go ahead and come on in, boys. Let's see it. But sources telling ABC News his case was dismissed because his family reportedly refused to cooperate with law enforcement. Nearly 18 months after that arrest this weekend, the horrific attack at Club Q, an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs, five people killed, at least 19 wounded. 
Tonight, authorities expected to formally charge the suspect with five counts of first-degree murder and five hate crime charges. We're going to uh, treat this like the highest level case that we can treat it. We're going to put to together a very strong prosecution team to make sure that we hold uh, the shooter accountable. At around 11.56 p.m. Saturday night, Michael Anderson, one of the first to spot the gunman. I heard like a like a pop, pop, pop. Once I looked up and I saw the, the shadow of a, of a, a grown man wielding a rifle. The first 911 calls came in at around 1157. What followed was five minutes of terror. We do have multiple critical. The gunman sprang the bar area with bullets. Something in my head said, get down, you know, just get down right now. So I did. And even before police arrived, two patrons risking their lives, charging the shooter. ABC News confirming Richard Fierro, an Army veteran, tackling the shooter, beating him with the suspect's own gun. Fierro telling the New York Times, I don't know exactly what I did. I just went into combat mode. I just know I have to kill this guy before he kills us. They risk their lives. They absolutely risk their lives. Heroes, I mean, there's no other word for that, right? Absolutely. Officers arriving on scene at around midnight, the alleged gunman taken into custody by 12.02 a.m. At that time, drag queen Wyatt Kent was on with a 911 dispatcher. And you immediately told her there is a woman who is yeah, yeah. bleeding I, on top I, of me? She said, is anyone hit? And I said, there's a woman on top of me. She was on my legs, um, and I could hear her moaning. She saved my life, and she passed away on top of me. Kent's fiance, 28-year-old Daniel Ashton, a bartender at the club, also killed. I'm very angry. I'm angry because this man took my friends, took, took the man I saw the rest of my life with. Tonight, authorities identifying the other four people killed, including Raymond Green Vance and Ashley Paw, and 40-year-old Kelly Loving, her sister telling us she was always fighting for people. And 38-year-old Derek Rump, his mother confirming his passing, saying he was a kind and loving person with a heart of gold. The details about each of the victims just makes it all the more heartbreaking. Matt Gutman joins us now from the scene in Colorado Springs. And Matt, as we saw in your report, the case involving an alleged bomb threat against the suspect's mother was dismissed. And because it was dismissed, authorities are now saying that the suspect purchased that AR-style rifle legally. And Lindsay, that's basically because of Colorado's um, privacy laws. When that case became dismissed, it essentially sealed the suspect's record. That enabled him, according to law enforcement officials, to go out and make that legal purchase of that AR-style rifle and the ammunition. Now, as for the suspect, he was due in court today, but because of what the DA said were significant injuries, he was not able to make his first appearance. He's still in the hospital. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. And joining us now is Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers. Mayor, we thank you so much for your time and, and condolences, first off, to, to your grieving community. can only imagine uh, what you all are grappling with. Uh, before we get to the investigation, I want to talk about the press conference earlier tonight where the police chief read the names of the five victims aloud and urged us all not to forget about them. Talk to us about your community tonight and, and what it's going through. Uh, Lindsay, thank you. Um, our community is doing exactly what I expected it to do. Uh, we were in shock and we were in mourning, but we are immediately uh, exhibiting the resilience that I would have expected from our community. We're providing emotional support, uh, sympathy uh, to the victims, to witnesses that were traumatized. Uh, we're arranging to make significant financial support to any victims that need it. You know, we've uh, had vigils, we've provided uh, uh, call-in lines. We've provided places where people can go uh, for counseling. Uh, as I say, we have a statewide fund that uh, handles situations like this and makes uh, uh, funds available. Uh, the police and prosecutor have made victim witness services available. And most of all, and I think uh, very importantly, I think our community has determined that justice is served in this case. And let's turn now to the two heroes who stopped the shooter just moments after he opened fire. I understand that you had a chance to talk with one of them earlier. Uh, can you tell me about that conversation? Yeah, I called Richard Fierro. Richard uh, is 50 years old. Uh, he was in the bar with his uh, wife and daughter. And um, when the shooter came in, uh, I won't go into uh, any more detail, although I think Richard's given some public interviews about it. Um, 
he and one other individual, a person by the name of Thomas James, uh, confronted the individual, and Richard actually was able to take a handgun uh, from the waist of the uh, suspect and use that to hit him and immobilize him uh, and uh, disable him uh, so that when the law enforcement actually came into the bar, uh, Richard Fierro uh, had subdued him and was on top of him, and law enforcement simply needed to uh, take him into custody. I incredibly heroic actions, given the fact uh, that uh, people had already been killed. Uh, this was an active shooter, could turn the weapon on anybody in there. Um, and uh, Richard Fierro was an incredibly humble man in the phone conversation I had. He simply reiterated, reiterated to me time and time again, I was there, I was trying to protect my family, and I did what I had to do. Um, and in doing that, uh, I am absolutely confident, and I think most people familiar, familiar with this incident are confident that he saved numerous lives. And certainly putting his own life at risk in doing so. And as we just heard in Matt's report, a man with the same name had a history with the police. In talking about the suspect here, in 2021, police were called because he was allegedly threatening his mother with a homemade bomb and other weapons. That led to a standoff with police in which he was wearing body armor, yelling obscenities, and threatening to set off a bomb. Why didn't that? Why wasn't that enough to trigger Colorado's red flag law? Well, first of all, um, let's, let's, let's talk about the fact that, unfortunately, because of a, a change in Colorado law in 2019 that caused for automatically uh, sealing a case regardless of the reason for which it's dismissed, uh, I am unable to talk about the existence or acknowledge the existence of such a case. But assuming such a case existed for a moment, uh, the red flag law still requires, even if the police seize a weapon temporarily, the police uh, still have to, if it's beyond a short period of time, have to show the credible evidence they have uh, to support the fact that the guy is a danger uh, with the weapon. And uh, if, for example, um, the complaining witnesses are wholly uncooperative and there is no such credible evidence, um, I question whether the uh, red flag, flag law could have been implemented. But I am curious because the police in this case themselves were witness to it. They were a party to this man saying that he was going to blow up, blow them up, right? And, and so I am curious now, based on that, if you're going to be calling on your own lawmakers to review the protocols around the state's red flag law in light of this tragedy where someone could demonstrate um, this potential for violence in front of police and then still get a gun. Threats have to be made in a context where there is an imminent threat they're going to be carried out. Uh, with the police standing there, uh, he may have been, uh, and I'm talking hypothetically here. Hypothetically. A person could be uh, on a tirade or something, but it actually not constitute a criminal offense. Whereas if he's putting people in imminent fear, uh, that could be a criminal offense. And if those witnesses aren't available, it may not be a prosecutable case, may not sustain uh, a red flag uh, a situation. What I'm encouraging everybody to do is hopefully uh, we will, uh, if in fact it's appropriate, and in fact, if there's a case of this nature, uh, we'll see a, a motion file to open that file, and then we can have a constructive conversation about whether or not there's anything in such a case uh, that should have caused uh, further law enforcement scrutiny. All right, Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers, we thank you so much for your time and once again our condolences to your community. Thank you so much. New details tonight about the hours leading up to and after the gruesome murders of the four students at the University of Idaho, including what two surviving roommates did when they couldn't reach the victims the morning that they were killed. Arcana Whitworth is in Idaho. Tonight, as investigators continue to seek the public's help in solving the brutal murders of four University of Idaho students, police say multiple people inside that off-campus house were on the line with dispatchers when the 911 call was made. The call coming in just before noon, hours after police say Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Shanna Kernadel, and her boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, were stabbed to death. Police say two roommates survived and that the 911 call came from one of their phones, but won't say who made the call. When they woke up, that's when, that's when they 
they noticed that some, they believed something was wrong. They called some friends and the friends came over. Authorities say the roommates were worried one of the victims had just passed out. Were they able to see the roommate? Were they behind a locked door? I'm not exactly sure the dynamics of what occurred inside the house. The two surviving roommates were already in the house when police say the victims arrived home around 1.45 a.m. And tonight, 20-year-old Ethan Chapin will be the first victim laid to rest. All of the victims just so young. Kana Whitworth joins us now. Hey, Kana, why haven't police released the 911 call or the names of the surviving roommates? Well, certainly, Lindsay, it's something we've asked for multiple times, but they do say this 911 call is crucial to this investigation. And, of course, they say, again, they keep reiterating that it was made from one of the surviving roommate's phones and adding that multiple people were on that call when it was finally made. What we can say, Lindsay, is authorities now confirming that there was a dog inside. There was a dog at the home when they arrived, and Kaylee's family saying that it was her dog. Authorities were out here again at the home. They were sort of combing through the crime scene again today looking for answers. We also spoke with the property management company that points out this is a really densely populated area of town. In fact, they said hundreds of people live in this one block radius. So, Lindsay, at this point, authorities remain hopeful that somebody knows something. All right. Kena Whitworth, our thanks to you. Now to the war in Ukraine and the Russian attacks on the power grid, including a major nuclear plant setting off international alarm. ABC's global affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz is in Kyiv. More than a dozen blasts rocked the area around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant this weekend, some of the shells landing inside the site itself. The fresh barrage of military strikes prompting an urgent warning from the UN nuclear watchdog that those responsible are playing with fire and calling for emergency measures to prevent a catastrophic nuclear accident. The shelling part of an intensifying Russian assault, Russia pounding Ukraine's eastern regions, some 400 strikes just yesterday alone, crippling power grids and leaving millions without heat and electricity. The destruction is evident almost anywhere you go in Ukraine. The Russians targeting not only infrastructure, but residential areas. In the nearly nine months of war, 40,000 civilians are estimated to have been killed. These five siblings now orphaned after a shell took the life of their 37-year-old single mother. 18-year-old Slava, who watched his mother die beside him, the only one left to give his siblings the care they need. Just believe in yourself, he told me, and this is how you can succeed. And your mother taught you that? No. Yes. Our thanks to Martha for that. Next to the brutal cold hitting much of the country as parts of New York are digging out from nearly seven feet of snow in some places. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking the cold and that critical holiday travel forecast. Ginger, is it safe to go out on the roads and go see grandma on Thursday? <laughs> Yeah, you know, we actually start to see a considerable warm up and some way better conditions than we've seen in past years for this, which is a very busy holiday week. So, Lindsay, let's go ahead and start uh, with what was the, you know, very cold. Jamestown to Watertown had 50 mile per hour gusts on top of what, four to six feet of fresh snow. So, they'll still be chilly tomorrow in the mid 20s. But look at the whole nation, even Las Vegas or a place like Jackson, Mississippi, only feeling like the upper 30s, low 40s. So, almost no one getting away for one more day of true winter before things start warming up, but they'll also start becoming a bit more stormy. Now on Wednesday itself, I have not seen one of the bigger travel days of the year look this clear. So that's great news because it's just kind of chilly here and you got some warm ups coming. A few snow flakes in the Rockies, but watch what goes on. This rain will also usher in much warmer temperatures. So for Thanksgiving itself, Louisiana could see some thunderstorms even um, from Atlanta to Raleigh. If you're traveling on Black Friday, Perhaps this impacts travel because it's already such high volume um, up in New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut. We'll also have some showers again, not a showstopper, but something to note. Here's the part that I think is interesting for most folks. A lot of people are saying, OK, we'll thaw out for a couple of days. See Nashville back into the 60s, Raleigh, same thing, New York, even 50. But look at Buffalo. With all that fresh snow, you go into the low 40s, you add rain. I'm worried that if we're already seeing some roof collapses now, the weight of that could get even heavier, and this could be too quick to rebound out of six feet of snow. Lindsay? All right, Ginger, our thanks to you. 
And when we come back, the investigation into a deadly crash after a car slammed into an Apple store with customers inside. You may know her from her role in Mission Impossible, the series, but now Michelle Monaghan tells us how her new nail-biting thriller actually triggered one of her own fears. But first, it's the biggest sporting event in the world, but behind the packed stadiums and riveting matches, there's actually a shadow over allegations of human rights violations and concerns about how some fans could be treated. A Will Reeve dives into these controversies from Qatar. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Basically, my job is one of the cooler jobs we have here on the team. I get to feed everybody today. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. As Iran's national anthem played during their soccer team's World Cup match today, the team, you see them there, remaining silent. It's an apparent show of support for anti-government protesters back home that have led to unrest in the country for months now. The team went on to play England, losing the match 6-2. to two. The U.S. men's team also played today, returning to the World Cup for the first time in eight years. They went up against Wales, starting out strong in the first half, but Wales came back in the second, ending the game in a draw. The U.S. plays again on Friday, going up against England. Amid the cheers and excitement of the matches at this year's tournament, there's also deep controversy. Host country Qatar has come under fire over concerns about the treatment of LGBTQ plus people and allegations of deaths linked to the building of the World Cup stadiums. ABC's Will Reeve has more from Qatar. Every four years, billions of people turn their focus and pin their dreams on the biggest sporting event on the planet. But this year, the World Cup begins under a shadow in the desert. The 2022 FIFA World Cup is 
Qatar. Skeptics and supporters alike were shocked that this tiny oil-rich nation won the right to host FIFA's signature showcase for the first time ever in the Middle East. A country smaller than Connecticut, with barely any soccer tradition and summer temperatures so punishing, the tournament's date had to be moved. We are here to announce the unsealing of charges and the arrests of individuals as part of our long-running investigation into bribery and corruption in the world of organized soccer. And after a years-long investigation that led to the conviction of several soccer executives in 2020, the Department of Justice explicitly accused Qatar of bribing FIFA officials to secure hosting rights. However, Qatar and FIFA denied the allegations and barreled on. Qatar had to build most of its World Cup infrastructure from scratch, but these buildings didn't just spring up out of the desert. Over two million migrants came here, mostly from Africa and South Asia, to build all of it, including most of the stadiums where the games will actually be played. But according to numerous reports from human rights organizations, the working conditions were dreadful. Hotels, public transportation, highways had to be built in a time crunch, and quickly the world's attention switched from bribery accusations to human rights violations. ESPN's E60 documentary, Qatar's World Cup, offers an incisive look. In early 2014, we went to Qatar to see what life was like there for migrant workers. Is this a hard place to be? The conditions were appalling. From 2009 to 2014, 680 Nepali workers died in Qatar. The deaths of most migrant workers are officially attributed to cardiac arrest. Gaziar says that in the more than two years that he worked in Qatar, he was able to send home only $880 to his wife and son. When he tried to switch jobs, he says the company he was working for wouldn't allow it. An investigation by The Guardian found that over 6,500 migrant workers died in Qatar since 2012. 37 of those deaths directly linked to the construction of the stadiums, while others suffered violence. Fans need to know um, how this came about, that the stadiums that they're sitting in was built uh, by workers and many of whom were in conditions of what we would call forced labor or other forms of modern slavery. The Qatari government disputed that the deaths were work-related, but after these accusations were made public, the labor laws were changed, <laughs> implementing labor courts where workers can bring cases against employers for mistreatment and the withholding of wages and the colonial-era kafala system, which gave employers significant control over migrant workers and their immigration status, was abolished. What attention, if any, have you paid to the surrounding controversy that keeps getting talked about? We've spoke to a lot of migrants while we've been here. We see a lot of them, and they all seem genuinely quite happy. Obviously, it doesn't take away from the fact of what has happened. It's a mixture. It's tough. You're trying to celebrate, but at the time, same time, you realize there's, uh, there's issues at stake here that are real. Other controversies and culture clashes persist. The anticipated one million fans traveling here for the World Cup will be expected to abide by a strict dress code. And fans learned just two days before the tournament that beer sales would be banned at all World Cup stadium sites, though VIPs in corporate suites would still have access to booze. It was a shock, but again, we're in the culture where um, drinking isn't a thing. Um, so, I mean, I think people need to embrace the culture as well. But yeah, I mean, I'm disappointed. <laughs> this viral incident days before the tournament highlighted Qatar's struggle to assimilate the world media into its culture of a tightly controlled press. So you're threatening us by, 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 by smashing the camera? Qatari officials apologized after the incident, while Qatar's emir has called the world's criticism an unprecedented campaign against the first Arab nation to hold the tournament. Listen, everybody's welcome in Doha. We do not stop anybody from coming to Doha with any different backgrounds, any different belief. Qatar is a very welcoming country. We have millions of people that come and visit our country. We welcome everybody, but also we expect and we want people to respect our culture. But not everyone feels welcome in Qatar. One of the biggest issues being that homosexuality is illegal in the Middle Eastern country. Qatar's ambassador for the World Cup addressing the issue in an interview with German TV. Let to say about the gay. Everybody, they will accept they come in here, but 
they will accept, they have to accept our rules. This haram, it's haram. Because why is haram? I am not big, one big Muslim, but it's haram, why? Because it's damaging the mind. There's concern about the country's treatment of LGBTQI residents and fans visiting the country. And players are speaking up, including the U.S. men's team, whose facility is decorated with a rainbow version of its team logo. The slogan that we have within our, in our team, um, be the change. We know that we're more than, than athletes uh, at the end of the day, and we can have an impact that, that lasts a lifetime. And when you look at social injustice, gun control, and things like that, we've been very vocal and outspoken against those things in our own country. So I think for us, it's bringing that here as well and bringing eyes and awareness to the situations that go on um, considering human rights. And some European soccer federations had announced their intention for captains to wear an armband with a rainbow heart, but then abandoned the idea after learning the captains would be given yellow cards if they took part in the initiative. This FIFA World Cup. Last month, FIFA President Gianni Infantino promised an inclusive World Cup, but in an extraordinary press conference on the eve of the tournament, he ignited a new controversy. Today I feel uh, Qatari. Today I feel Arab. Today I feel uh, gay. Today I feel uh, a migrant worker. I think for what we Europeans have been doing in the last 3,000 years around the world, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 years before starting to give moral lessons. And with the World Cup just kicking off, We've yet to see what the next four weeks will bring. Our thanks to Will Reeve for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the Indian Child Welfare Act has been lauded as a way to keep Native children connected with their tribes. But now a Supreme Court case is making its future uncertain. But police say they uncovered at the home of a man accused of threatening to attack a synagogue. And with the World Cup in full effect, we take a closer look at how the makeup of the male USA team looks similar to the makeup of America by the numbers. But first, our post of the day, J-Lo and Ben Affleck looking right at the camera. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Before Columbine, Newtown, Parkland, and Uvalde. We're driving to Paducah, Kentucky right now. It's the site of one of the first school shootings back in 1997, and the gunman Michael Carneal is actually up for parole. This is the kind of thing that's going to me up for the rest of my life. I'll always remember that day and what I saw. What would you guys do if there was an active shooter in the school? You were fighting for your life. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming only on Hulu. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. By now, you've by sure heard the buzz around the 2022 World Cup kicking off in Qatar. But here's one more note on the U.S. men's national team, which, just like the country they represent, is more diverse than ever. Here's a closer look by the numbers. There are 26 players on the U.S. roster, born in nine different states and four different countries. They span in age. The youngest is just a teenager, 19-year-old Yunus Musa, who was born in New York City when his mother from Ghana was on vacation here. The oldest is defender Tim Ream, one of two Missouri natives on the squad who at 35 years old has been affectionately nicknamed Grandpa. For many, the path to the U.S. national team has been global 22-year-old winger Timothy Weya, who scored the only American goal in their draw today against Wales, was born in Brooklyn, but his father, a former soccer great himself, is the current president of Liberia. Or take Sergino Dest, who wears number two for the U.S. side. He was born in the Netherlands to a Dutch mother and a Surinamese uh, American father, but picked the stars and stripes when it came to international play. And all the team reportedly speaks seven languages. There are also 12 black players on the 2022 roster, a record for a sport that in the U.S. at least is known for lacking diversity. Consider the last time the U.S. qualified for the World Cup in 2014, there were only three black players. This year's squad also features four Hispanic players, which is not a record, but does help make this the most diverse roster the U.S. men's national team has ever had. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime, the shocking return of one of the most respected names in the media world and the reality TV couple about to be sentenced for tax crimes. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Before Columbine, Newtown, Parkland, and Uvalde. We're driving to Paducah, Kentucky right now. It's the site of one of the first school shootings back in 1997, and the gunman, Michael Carneal, is actually up for parole. This is the kind of thing that's gonna f me up for the rest of my life. I'll always remember that day and what I saw. What would you guys do if there was an active shooter in the school? You were fighting for your life. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming only on Hulu. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Basically, my job is one of the cooler jobs we have here on the team. I get to feed everybody today. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Thank you. 
a growing memorial outside of Club Q, Colorado Springs' only LGBTQ nightclub. It's the place where police say a suspect stormed inside and opened fire, killing five and injuring at least 19. We will hold uh, people accountable as we identify um, what charges should be filed in this case. The suspect, 22-year-old Anderson Lee Aldrich, allegedly entering Club Q just before midnight, armed with an assault-style rifle, which officials say was legally purchased, along with another gun and multiple magazines of ammunition. Witnesses say he began shooting right away. Police say they were on the scene within three minutes of the first 911 call, taking Aldrich into custody shortly after. Witnesses say two patrons tackled him and beat him with his own weapon. Aldrich being treated at a local hospital. If this had gone on for several minutes more and that heroic action had not been taken, I can only imagine how many more fatalities we might have had. Law enforcement officials in Hingham, Massachusetts are investigating why an SUV crashed through the front window of an Apple store. The crash killed one person and injured at least 16 others, with some people getting pinned against the wall of the store. Officials said they were speaking with the driver of the dark-colored SUV to determine what happened and if any criminal charges were warranted. This morning was an unthinkable morning, and people are trying to get through it and process what happened. A 21-year-old man taken into custody at Penn Station after police say he made online threats to attack a New York City synagogue. New York City Mayor Eric Adams promising added protection for the Jewish community in the weeks to come. This was not an idle threat. This was a real threat. The suspect, Christopher Brown, told investigators that he has a, quote, sick personality. Police recovered a Glock semi-automatic firearm with an extended 30-round magazine, a large hunting knife, a black ski mask, and a Nazi armband. The stars of the reality TV series Chrisley Knows Best have been sentenced to federal prison time for their roles in a bank fraud scheme. A judge sentenced Todd Chrisley to 12 years in prison and his wife Julie Chrisley to seven years in prison. The Chrisleys were found guilty on charges of bank fraud and tax evasion over the summer. Prosecutors allege that the couple stole $30 million by faking documents to obtain fraudulent loans and hid the money from the IRS, all while flaunting their lavish lifestyle. NASA has released new images showing the Orion capsule orbiting the moon. The capsule passed just over 80 miles above the moon's surface at its closest approach, passing over the landing sites of Apollo 11, 12, and 14. The orbit marked completion of the first part of Orion's mission, which is to reach the moon and return while carrying three test dummies. The capsule is set to splash back down on Earth on December 11th. It's the first U.S. capsule to reach the moon in 50 years. President Biden taking part in an annual White House tradition, the Thanksgiving turkey pardon. The president giving a reprieve to two big turkeys from North Carolina, chocolate and chip. Based on their temperament and commitment to being productive members of society, I hereby pardon. I hereby pardon, yes. <laughs> I hereby pardon chocolate and chip. Chocolate and chip now live out the rest of their life at a research center at the North Carolina State University. Welcome back. Tonight, as we celebrate Native American Heritage Month, we're taking a closer look at a major Supreme Court case involving indigenous children. For years, the Indian Child Welfare Act has been called the gold standard for keeping Native foster kids connected to their tribes. But now all of that could be on the line due to a landmark legal battle over race, family, and adoption. Here's our Devin Dwyer reporting in tonight from Fort Worth, Texas. Get push high. They're a blended American family in a fight to stay together. Well, in December, we have a court hearing again for the adoption of our son's sister. And if we lose, she could be taken away. Dr. Jennifer Burkeen, an anesthesiologist, and her husband, Chad, a civil engineer and stay-at-home dad, are parents to two biological children and two Native American siblings they fostered for years. And how much do they know about what's going on? We hope very little. Cultural considerations are a challenge for every adoptive family, no matter what race they are or what race their children are. Are you getting sleepy? For Native foster children, no. those cultural considerations also have a legal dimension. Since 1978, the Indian Child Welfare Act Act, or ICWA, has set rules for who can adopt Native American kids, giving preference first to immediate family, then a member of the child's tribe, then to an unrelated tribe, before potential parents who are non-Native. The interest in a 
young tribal citizen, the child, in, in staying with her tribe is a high interest. It's an answer to the forced removal of hundreds of thousands of Native children from their tribes over generations, separated from their families and placed in government-run boarding schools or Christian churches through the 1960s. The tribes say ICWA has been critical to keeping their cultures alive and protecting their sovereignty as independent nations. If you start to remove the next generation of any society, you really start to erode that society. The Indian Child Welfare Act is quite a stout law to go up against. The justification to deviate from that law is a pretty high bar to overcome. To foster families like the Burkines, ICWA is a barrier to adoption of children they've nurtured and loved for most of their young lives. In an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, the couple says the law is not only unreasonable, but unconstitutional. For him to just get taken away and moved to someone he's never met before, who he's not related to, it didn't seem like the right thing to do as his mom. By giving adoption priority to Native families over white families, they say the law discriminates on the basis of race. It defines an Indian child as a child who is either a tribal member or could someday become a tribal member based entirely on biological ancestry. The Burkines moved to adopt their seven-year-old son after fostering him for more than a year. But despite approval from his biological family, the Navajo Nation challenged the adoption in court under Ick <laughs> After a two-year legal battle, the tribe backed down, but now the family is fighting to adopt his younger sister, their four-and-a-half-year-old foster daughter, whose state officials were prepared to place with a native family nearly 1,000 miles away because of the law. In the state system, certainly we would have been the first call. So in other words, you're saying if she had not been Native American, the first call would have been to you? 100%. Neither the Navajo Nation nor the children's relatives responded to ABC News' repeated requests for an interview. But in court documents, the tribe argues that ICWA protects the best interests of Indian children and promotes the stability and security of Indian tribes and families. They argue the long-standing adoption preferences are not based on race, but on political qualifications for tribal citizenship. I am... My ancestors' wildest dreams. This is punk who and it's... Autumn Adams, a member of the Yakima Nation, is among dozens of former foster youth asking the Supreme Court to uphold the law. Being American Indian is not a racial matter, it's a political matter. We're members of tribal nations that are sovereign nations. She says she's an ICWA success story after landing in the Washington state foster system at nine years old when her father died by suicide. My mother at that time was addicted to alcohol and some hard drugs. Immediately after that, actually, she spiraled in a really dark hole. Right before you suit. Autumn and her younger brother, John, were taken into state custody and later placed with tribal relatives. What would have happened if they had not found a, a, a relative to take you? My assumption is they would have split me and John up. Potentially with a non-Native family. More than likely with a non-Native family. There are not a lot of Native foster homes. Native children are four times more likely than white children to be placed in foster care in this country. More than a decade ago, 27% of Native foster kids were placed with other family members. Today, it's up to 38%, an improvement experts attribute to ICWA. Tribal families know what they're doing. Yes, there are challenges, but what was happening in the century before ICWA was just so detrimental to, to tribal communities. After turning 19, Autumn won custody of her two younger siblings and says their personal bond and family traditions show why ICWA matters. Even to this day, we are working on relearning our language and we still continue to practice our traditional teachings. But the Burkines insist equal opportunity to adopt doesn't have to come at the expense of culture. We do share a lot of common values with the Native Americans, um, with taking care of each other, with uh, the emphasis on family and the emphasis on elders and, and children um, of those in need. The nation's 574 tribes say the stakes in the Burkine case are bigger than one family. If the Supreme Court strikes down ICWA as discrimination on the basis of race, they say it could upend decades of Indian law treating tribes as independent political nations. If our sovereignty is eroded because of this case, uh, 
uh, we're going to have a setback that will take generations to repair if we can repair it at all. The Burkines say their focus remains on their family, hoping the nation's highest court strikes a balance between respect for tribes and young children who have already been through so much. Attachment is one of the most important things, and we're not saying that culture is not important. We do believe culture is important, but it's not the most important thing. Our thanks to Devin for that. Switching gears next to the surprising and stunning comeback at Disney, the parent company of ABC News. Former CEO Bob Iger is making a return to lead the company after less than a full year in retirement. The announcement came after the Disney board removed Bob Chapek as chief executive officer following a series of alleged missteps. Iger previously served as Disney's chief executive from 2005 to 2020 during a period that is widely regarded as one of the most successful in Hollywood history. Iger has been given two years by by the board to steer the company on the right path and to groom a successor. It's the burden of domestic care workers stepping into a new home and watching after children who are not their own. That work is at the center of the new film Nanny, a horror movie about an, Afri an African woman who hopes that her child ch uh, care job will help bring her own son to the United States. Our Trevor Alt sat down with one of the stars, Michelle Monaghan, about making a movie that has the long reach for the American dream at its core. I miss you. Na, 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 da, da. Love you, mommy. Say bye-bye. Hi, mommy. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. Okay. Here's any number you need, including her therapist. Thank you. Michelle. Hi. Hi. Wonderful <laughs> to have you here. Nice to be here. Thank the you. The film already an award winner having won the grand jury prize at Sundance yes. here. Yes. And it seems like it's living up to the hype. How do you feel about the finished product? I am so excited about the finished product, you know. Um, to to be a part of a film, a small independent film, you know, it takes a lot these days to have them to be made, to even make it into a film festival, to win Sundance was just such a, a huge win for us. And then to come out with um, distribution is incredible. So it's having a nice little ride and I'm just so excited for our you know, our film, our cast, um, but specifically our, our writer-director, Nick Yatujusu. Right, and I've heard you just heap praise yeah. on her. I mean, what was that like working with her? <laughs> well, I just knew from the moment that I read the script that it was an extraordinarily special film. She's just someone who has a very, very unique critical voice and an important one. And once I saw that we were really creative creatively aligned in terms of um, on what she wanted this film to be and what this role to convey, uh, I jumped on board. Mm. It's called Nanny, mm -hmm. uh, about an undocumented woman becomes a nanny for a, an affluent family. You are the mother of that family. Uh, and she sort of becomes haunted by these things as she's trying to bring her own child over from Senegal. It's really shot and lit creatively. Mm -hmm. How is that experience on the set as you're watching it play out? Can you tell or is it something you're surprised about afterwards? I think what makes the film really unique is that we're seeing it through the eyes of an undocumented immigrant, oftentimes an overlooked um, domestic worker that helps with the upward mobility of affluent people. Anna Jope is our leading actress. Uh, she plays the, the character of Aisha and she is the nanny and there's a lot more color and, and warmth in the way that she is lit but I think that's what audiences will really appreciate about it. It's a story unlike that we've heard before. It's a particular gaze um, and yet the film is very unique in the way that um, in the way that you watch it as well. Now, I know that you said when you got the script you kind of had to sit with it for a little bit. Why was that? I did, you know, I, I, it was very confronting. I would say that it made me very uncomfortable um, in the most perfect way. And, and as an actor, I wanted to lean into um, that discomfort. Uh, I think that it's a very evocative um, film. I think, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do with this woman was to really um, humanize a character and not necessarily, necessarily in the traditional sense that we might empathize with her, but to hope that the audience might look at this woman with a very introspective lens and maybe see how um, they might see facets of Amy in themselves, really um, facets of, of uh, judgments, um, bias, racism, and, and things, and, and really see how they might actually 
um, perpetuate those things in their own life. The little microaggressions as opposed yeah. to overt. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I think that's really important. I think that people understand really now, hopefully, a little bit more about what microaggressions are. The certain actions and the certain things that she says to Aisha are things that whittle away her humanity. Sometimes who we are on the inside is a little bit scarier than what the things are on the outside. And, and how we perpetuate things and how that permeates we pay those things forward, and, and we see a lot of that uh, with Amy's character. It's interesting you use the word scarier. I was watching an interview you did like six years ago, mm -hmm. and you said that the motivator behind all the roles that you choose is fear. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and that was the case in this? Yeah, definitely. It, it, it triggered a different kind of fear for me, something that is like a, a truly is a white woman who's privileged. This is a perspective that I want to explore. I have something to learn from this. Um, I really, really wanted to work with uh, Nick Yatu. Uh, and so, you know, to be able to kind of tackle that and to have those vulnerable conversations, to lean into things that I normally w wasn't aware of, um, it felt like a very timely and important thing for me to do. What about the aspects of motherhood? I mean, I know that your character mm -hmm. and, and the main character mm -hmm. have some overlap and that they're both women yes. striving. Yes. Uh, did you, were you able to pull some as a mother yourself? Absolutely. I think, again, something that Nick Yatu does and something that we haven't really explored before or seen is really the hierarchy of, of womenhood in kind of a patriarchal society and how we all sort of need each other to kind of survive and to succeed. And yet, um, and some people sacrifice obviously more for that. So often we don't think of, of immigrants having left their own children behind so that they could help service the mobility of, of, of people that hire them with their families. And so we don't necessarily think of that perspective, and this, and this film actually asks us to. You and, and Anna were raving about Nick Yatu as a director, and, you, and there was this great answer when asked, like, what makes her so good? And Anna told the story of how Nick Yatu wiped snot from her face yes. uh, on the set. Yes. Uh, I'm going to guess that she didn't wipe snot from your face, yes. but I would imagine that you were also receiving a lot of that care. Absolutely. Her. She was so comfortable in her skin, and she knew exactly what she wanted. She really created time and space for us to rehearse, and Nick Yatu helped us achieve that. And she just created a really wonderful environment. And also, in the 20 years that I've been working, it was the most diverse, young, and inclusive sets that I've ever worked on in my life. And I think that was a direct result of, of Nick Yatu. And I think that that is important. That is the kind of industry we want to work in. That is reflective of our world. And I think that we should all be accountable to that. And most importantly, we all need to hire it. And she's just an incredible leader um, and just a wonderful example. And I'm just, I'm just so proud to know her. Michelle, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Very nice to meet you, Trevor. Thank you. Michelle and Trevor sold it. I will look forward to seeing that. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Nanny is out in select theaters on Wednesday, and you can stream it on Prime Video starting December 16th. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. Jay Leno, surrounded by hospital staff just days after he suffered serious burns in a gasoline fire. He spent nine days in the hospital, but he was discharged today, and we are certainly wishing him a speedy recovery. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For the next hour, it's a looming deadline that could lead to a rail strike that could cripple the U.S. supply chain. The demands workers are holding out for. As parts of the U.S. dig out from nearly seven feet of snow, our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking your holiday forecast. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there?
Yeah. Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From the giant sequoias to the waterfalls, it's an amazing place. But in Yosemite, criminals go on vacation too. A park ranger found partial human remains. That was a human hand. That opened the possibility of suspects. Henry Lee Lucas. Carrie Stainer. Donald Gibson. Any of them could have done it. We're going to figure this thing out. Wild Crime, Season 2, Murder in Yosemite. Now streaming only on Hulu. Before Columbine, Newtown, Parkland, and Uvalde. We're driving to Paducah, Kentucky right now. It's the site of one of the first school shootings back in 1997, and the gunman, Michael Carneal, is actually up for parole. This is the kind of thing that's gonna f me up for the rest of my life. I'll always remember that day and what I saw. What would you guys do if there was an active shooter in the school? You were fighting for your life. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming only on Hulu. Welcome back. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The U.S. faces a growing risk of a crippling national freight rail strike in two weeks. The nation's largest union, which represents conductors, announced that its members have rejected a tentative deal. The second largest union, representing engineers, ratified its contract, but all of the unions representing railroad workers must reach a contract deal to avert a strike. Several other smaller unions have also turned down their contracts, saying that they failed to address demand schedules and quality of life issues. The White House said today that they are working with both sides to avoid a strike. Taiwanese chip maker TSMC has confirmed plans to build its most advanced chips in the U.S. Company founder Morris Chang said that the details are still being finalized, but that the new plant would be built alongside a lower-end plant slated to start production in 2024. The chip maker is the sole supplier for Apple, which has been pushing to secure its supply chain. RSV hospitalization rates in adults are now the highest they've been in the past nine years. Right now, nine times as many adults are in the hospital with RSV than this time in 2018 to 19. Public health experts are warning that the respiratory virus isn't only a threat to young children, but the elderly, those with chronic heart or lung disease, and the in immunocompromised are also at risk. There's new information tonight about the suspect in the Colorado Springs nightclub shooting. The suspect was previously arrested for allegedly threatening his mother with a homemade bomb and gun, but he was never prosecuted and never flagged under the state's red flag law. ABC's Matt Gutman is in Colorado Springs with the latest details. Tonight, for the first time, we're seeing video showing the suspected Colorado mass shooter surrendering to police during an arrest last year for allegedly making bomb threats against his own mother. Anderson Lee Aldrich seen with his hands up, taken into custody and charged with menacing and kidnapping. In live stream video, now deleted, you can see the suspect wearing body armor before that arrest and hear him making threats. If they breach, I'm gonna blow it to holy hell. So, uh... Go ahead and come on in, boys. Let's see it. But sources telling ABC News his case was dismissed because his family reportedly refused to cooperate with law enforcement. Nearly 18 months after that arrest this weekend, the horrific attack at Club Q, an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs, five people killed, at least 19 wounded. Tonight, authorities expected to formally charge the suspect with five counts of first degree murder and five hate crime charges. The devastation this violent act has had in our community cannot be measured. At around 11.56 p.m. Saturday night, Michael Anderson, one of the first to spot the gunman. I heard like a like a pop, pop, pop. Once I looked up and I saw the, the shadow of, a, of a, a grown man wielding a rifle. The first 911 calls came in at around 11.57. What followed was five minutes of terror. We do have multiple critical the gunman sprang the bar area with bullets. Something in my head said, get down, you know, just get down right now. So I did. And even before police arrived, two patrons risking their lives, charging the shooter. ABC News confirming Richard Fierro, an Army veteran, tackling the shooter, beating him with the suspect's own gun. Fierro telling the New York Times, I don't know exactly what I did. I just went into combat mode. I just know I have to kill this guy. 
before he kills us. They risk their lives. They absolutely risk their lives. Heroes, I mean, there's no other word for that, right? Absolutely. Officers arriving on scene at around midnight, the alleged gunman taken into custody by 12.02 a.m. At that time, drag queen Wyatt Kent was on with a 911 dispatcher. And you immediately told her there is a woman who is yeah, yeah. bleeding I, on top I, of I, me? She said, is anyone hit? And I said, there's a woman on top of me. She was on my legs, um, and I could hear her moaning. She saved my life, and she passed away on top of me. Kent's fiance, 28-year-old Daniel Ashton, a bartender at the club, also killed. I'm very angry. I'm angry because this man took my friends, took, took the man I saw the rest of my life with. Tonight, authorities identifying the other four people killed, including Raymond Green Vance and Ashley Paw, and 40-year-old Kelly Loving, her sister telling us she was always fighting for people. And 38-year-old Derek Rump, his mother confirming his passing, saying he was a kind and loving person with a heart of gold. Matt Gutman from Colorado Springs. At least one person was killed and 16 injured when a car smashed through the glass walls of an Apple store south of Boston. Witnesses say the driver was going fast, and now police are trying to determine if it was an accident or intentional. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has those details. Tonight, this Massachusetts community shaken after an SUV crashed into this Apple store in Hingham, a suburb south of Boston, killing one and leaving at least 16 hospitalized. Apple store for a motor vehicle accident, motor vehicle into the building. 911 calls coming in around 1045 this morning, shortly after the store opened. Authorities say this dark colored SUV plowing through the store's plate glass window at an undetermined speed. We got people trapped by the car in the Store. First responders finding people with numerous injuries inside the store, multiple others receiving care on the ground outside. The Apple Store is a very busy place, uh, and it's Monday of a, of a holiday week. The absolute unthinkable event that occurred at that store when you're just going there to buy a phone or get something fixed. Lindsay, authorities say this is an ongoing criminal investigation, and that driver was taken into police custody. Lindsay. So senseless. Stephanie, thank you. New details tonight about the hours leading up to and after the gruesome murders of four students at the University of Idaho, including what two surviving roommates did when they couldn't reach the victims the morning that they were killed. Arcana Whitworth is in Idaho. Tonight, as investigators continue to seek the public's help in solving the brutal murders of four University of Idaho students, police say multiple people inside that off-campus house were on the line with dispatchers when the 911 call was made. The call coming in just before noon, hours after police say Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Shanna Kernadel, and her boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, were stabbed to death. Police say two roommates survived and that the 911 call came from one of their phones, but won't say who made the call. When they woke up, that's when, that's when they, they noticed that some, they believed something was wrong. They called some friends and the friends came over. Authorities say the roommates were worried one of the victims had just passed out. Were they able to see the roommate? Were they behind a locked door? I'm not exactly sure the dynamics of what occurred inside the house. The two surviving roommates were already in the house when police say the victims arrived home around 1.45 a.m. And tonight, 20-year-old Ethan Chapin will be the first victim laid to rest. All of the victims just so young. Kana Whitworth joins us now. Hey, Kana, why haven't police released the 911 call or the names of the surviving roommates? Well, certainly, Lindsay, it's something we've asked for multiple times, but they do say this 911 call is crucial to this investigation. And, of course, they say, again, they keep reiterating that it was made from one of the surviving roommate's phones and adding that multiple people were on that call when it was finally made. What we can say, Lindsay, is authorities now confirming that there was a dog inside. There was a dog at the home when they arrived, and Kaylee's family saying that it was her dog. Authorities were out here again at the home. They were sort of combing through the crime scene again today looking for answers. Answers. We also spoke with the property management company that points out this is a really densely populated area of town. In fact, they said hundreds of people live in this one block radius. So, Lindsay, at this point, authorities remain hopeful that somebody knows something. All right. Kena Whitworth, our thanks to you.
Now to the early maneuvering in the race for 2024 already. This is taking place on the Republican side, of course. Several possible frontrunners, including former President Trump, the only declared candidate so far, they are making their case in an event in Las Vegas. And for some of them who once stood with Trump, that now means making a case against him. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, a clear message from some of Donald Trump's most loyal allies. After the Republican Party's poor showing in the midterms, it's time to move on. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, one of several top Trump officials and advisors, now signaling they'll challenge him for the Republican nomination. Personality and celebrity just aren't going to get it done. We can see that. Trump's one-time close advisor, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. The fact of the matter is the reason we're losing is because... Donald Trump has put himself before everybody else. Trump's former ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, once said she would not run if Trump did. Now she says she's giving it serious thought. We just lived through a disheartening election. It should be a wake-up call for all of us. Fresh off his landslide victory, New Hampshire's Republican Governor Chris Sununu says the message of the midterms is clear. Let's stop supporting crazy, unelectable candidates in our primaries and start getting behind winners. And it all comes after Trump's former Vice President Mike Pence told David the party can do better in 2024. We do know that the former president could announce any day now that he's running for president yet again. Given all that you witnessed in the Capitol on that day, this is a pretty straightforward question, a yes or a no. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? David, I think that's up to the American people. But I think we'll have better choices in the future. And some anticipate that Mike Pence himself will be one of those choices. Rachel Scott joins us now from Washington. Rachel, former President Trump uh, appeared virtually at that conference over the weekend. He became a candidate, of course, just days ago. But some of his most loyal supporters are now making it clear that that won't stop them from taking him on. That's exactly right, Lindsay. And when Trump addressed that group, he argued that the Republican Party is bigger, even more powerful since he was elected. But even some of his closest allies have made it clear they are willing to fight for the Republican nomination in 2024, largely brushing off that third run for president. Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. Now to the war in Ukraine and the Russian attacks on the power grid, including a major nuclear plant setting off international alarm. ABC's global affairs correspondent Martha Ranitz is in Kyiv. More than a dozen blasts rocked the area around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant this weekend, some of the shells landing inside the site itself. The fresh barrage of military strikes prompting an urgent warning from the UN nuclear watchdog that those responsible are playing with fire and calling for emergency measures to prevent a catastrophic nuclear accident. The shelling part of an intensifying Russian assault, Russia pounding Ukraine's eastern regions, some 400 strikes just yesterday alone, crippling power grids and leaving millions without heat and electricity. The destruction is evident almost anywhere you go in Ukraine. The Russians targeting not only infrastructure, but residential areas. In the nearly nine months of war, 40,000 civilians are estimated to have been killed. These five siblings now orphaned after a shell took the life of their 37-year-old single mother. 18-year-old Slava, who watched his mother die beside him, the only one left to give his siblings the care they need. Just believe in yourself, he told me, and this is how you can succeed. And your mother taught you that? No. And the cold, I imagine, is only making things worse. Martha joins us now from Kievit. And Martha, I want to go back to that power plant. You said that some of the shells landed inside the site? Uh, they landed right inside the site. And e even though there's been no radiation leak from the shelling, there was some damage. So today, President Zelensky urged NATO members to guarantee protection of Ukraine's nuclear plants from Russian sabotage so this doesn't happen again. Lindsay? All right, Martha Raditz reporting in from Kiev. Thank you so much, Martha. Now to the holiday travel week as millions are sent to travel for Thanksgiving. In parts of New York, they're still digging out from nearly seven feet of snow. And tonight there's a new system that we're watching. Ginger Z will time that out for us in a few minutes. But first, Matt Rivers is in Orchard Park, Buffalo. 
Tonight, after nearly seven feet of record-breaking snow in spots, homes, cars, streets, all covered. Authorities begging residents to stay off the road so they can clear them. They're using front loaders and dump trucks, families using shovels. This is my first attempt, and I'm not going to be able to get my car out. It's too heavy. After 81 inches of snow in Hamburg, New York, one family opening their garage door to this monster snow drift. This is wet, heavy snow, and this is what it can do. This historic bowling alley caving in, its walls collapsing under the weight. Snowfall rates up to six inches per hour stranded dozens of drivers that dared go out in it. Many of those vehicles tagged and taken to this parking lot at the local mall. Okay, it's classic. With some even needing a jump start to get going again. And as the plows work around the clock to get the roads clear, the record-breaking amounts of snow fueling real worries tonight that more buildings, even homes, could also cave in. Just surreal the amount of snow there. Our thanks to Matt Rivers. Next to the brutal cold hitting much of the country as parts of New York are digging out from nearly seven feet of snow in some places. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking the cold and that critical holiday travel forecast. Ginger, is it safe to go out on the roads and go see grandma on Thursday? <laughs> Yeah, you know, we actually start to see a considerable warm up and some way better conditions than we've seen in past years for this, which is a very busy holiday week. So, Lindsay, let's go ahead and start uh, with what was the, you know, very cold. Jamestown to Watertown had 50 mile per hour gusts on top of what, four to six feet of fresh snow. So, they'll still be chilly tomorrow in the mid 20s. But look at the whole nation, even Las Vegas or a place like Jackson, Mississippi, only feeling like the upper 30s, low 40s. So, almost no one getting away for one more day of true winter before things start warming up, but they'll also start becoming a bit more stormy. Now on Wednesday itself, I have not seen one of the bigger travel days of the year look this clear. So that's great news because it's just kind of chilly here and you got some warm ups coming. A few snow flakes in the Rockies, but watch what goes on. This rain will also usher in much warmer temperatures. So for Thanksgiving itself, Louisiana could see some thunderstorms even um, from Atlanta to Raleigh. If you're traveling on Black Friday, Perhaps this impacts travel because it's already such high volume um, up in New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut. We'll also have some showers again, not a showstopper, but something to note. Here's the part that I think is interesting for most folks. A lot of people are saying, OK, we'll thaw out for a couple of days. See Nashville back into the 60s, Raleigh, same thing, New York, even 50. But look at Buffalo. With all that fresh snow, you go into the low 40s, you add rain. I'm worried that if we're already seeing some roof collapses now, the weight of that could get even heavier, and this could be too quick to rebound out of six feet of snow. Lindsay? All right, Ginger, our thanks to you. An unusual comeback to report at Disney. Former CEO Bob Iger has announced he is returning to the lead to lead the company after almost a year gap. Disney is the parent company of ABC News. Here's our chief business correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis. Tonight, former Disney CEO Bob Iger making a surprise comeback, returning to the top job less than a year after leaving the company. Disney's board of directors asking Iger to return. Iger starting at ABC more than four decades ago. He began as an entry-level studio supervisor, once joking, I was the assistant to the production assistant. He would work his way up to CEO and spend 15 years in that role. Time magazine naming him Business Person of the Year in 2019. Tonight, Iger taking over with a mandate from the board of directors to lead the company through this pivotal period. During his tenure as CEO, Iger oversaw tremendous growth leading the charge on major acquisitions, including Pixar, to infinity and beyond! Marvel, Avengers! Assemble. and Lucasfilm. May the force be with you. Striking a deal to purchase assets from 21st Century Fox. Outstanding. And launching streaming platform Disney Plus. Tonight, Iger saying in a statement, I am extremely optimistic for the future of this great company and thrilled to be asked by the board to return as its CEO. And in an email to employees overnight saying, it is with an incredible sense of gratitude and humility, and I must admit a bit of amazement, that I write you this evening with the news that I am returning to the Walt Disney Company as chief executive officer, adding, I am excited to embark with you on many new endeavors. 
He is back. Rebecca Jarvis is back with us as well. So, Becky, how do Wall Street expectations for Disney factor into all this? Well, Lindsay, just weeks ago, Disney missed Wall Street expectations when it reported earnings. And today, the stock rallied on that news, up more than 6% as Wall Street digests this information. Of course, Bob Iger was known for many successes and certainly added a great deal of value to the stock as well during his 15-year tenure as CEO. And now he's back. Lindsay? Many welcoming his return. Rebecca Jarvis, our thanks to you. And still to come, the desperate search for survivors in the rubble after a powerful earthquake kills more than 160 people. And finding a good book can sometimes be an overwhelming task. Author Kenneth C. Davis tells us how his latest work takes some of the pressure off and gives readers the keys to finding the best great short books. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In Indonesia, a powerful earthquake killed at least 162 people and injured hundreds. The death toll is expected to rise as rescue efforts continue in the remote rural area. Hospitals were overwhelmed with injured people. More than 13,000 people whose homes were heavily damaged were taken to evacuation centers. In Venice, flood defenses were activated when a seasonal high tide submerged St. Mark's Square and many other parts of the floating city. New glass barriers protect the famed St. Mark's Basilica. Venice's seasonal floods have been exacerbated in recent years by rising sea levels and increasingly high tides. And in Qatar, one and a half million soccer fans are converged for the World Cup. Day two of the soccer's marquee event is making headlines well beyond the sports world. European teams dropped their plans to wear armbands that were seen as a rebuke to the Qatar's human rights record after the sports governing body threatened to issue violations to any player wearing them. And Iran's team did not sing their national anthem and did not celebrate their goals in a show of solidarity with the protest movement that has roiled their country for months. For a lot of people, getting into reading can be daunting, whether it's choosing which books to read or slowly checking off must-read literary classics or fully understanding the writing, the symbolism, or the historical context. One author is stepping in to help you out. Great Short Books promises to help readers with some common book-choosing dilemmas. Author Kenneth C. Davis, my long-lost cousin, <laughs> is here and, and joins us now in studio. Thank you so much for joining us today. It, it is a great pleasure, Lindsay. Thanks for having 
me and no relation as far as I know. That's right. We, we don't know. Uh, many people, though, will know you from your Don't Know Much About series. So how did you decide now that you were going to put this compilation together of, of the best short books? Sure. I, I have lived a life in books, even though most people would know me as a historian. I've written about Don't Know Much About History. I've written about American presidents who enslaved people. I wrote about the Spanish flu uh, pandemic a few years ago. But to me, it was always the story in history. It wasn't dates and battles and speeches. And as a lover of books since the time I was a small child, I needed to do something during the pandemic to take me out of what we all call doom scrolling. Uh, this dreadful news every day, plus the sense of isolation, the sleeplessness. And I found a real treasure by going back to reading fiction. And because our attention spans were short, I focused on short fiction, books of 200 pages or less that could be read, read in perhaps one sitting, but certainly within a week. And so I read 58 books, hence a year of great reading. And so then how did you ultimately decide which ones you were going to include? Did you go by author first or story first? or and, and because it's a really wide variety and quite a mixture that you have here. It, it is a wide variety, and I specifically set out to include a wide variety. First of all, an equal number of male and female writers. They're equally divided. Uh, I also wanted to read books that I had read before to go revisit them, because there's a real value to rereading a book from your childhood, perhaps you've read, or maybe something you were assigned in school and you, right. you hated it then I can tell you that reading The Old Man in the Sea, for instance, which is in the book, um, when you're 16 and reading it when you're 60 is a very, very different experience. This story of this old man who catches this fish and what becomes of it. Um, so the, the process was actually culling through hundreds of books. I read many more books than the 58 I finished with, but I really wanted a, an interesting collection of diversity. And you write, a novel is a measure of the times in which it is written. And I'm curious which ones you feel even though they may have been written perhaps centuries ago, still reflect the current times? That's a really great and important question. And I wasn't thinking about it so much while I read the books, but as it as I was going along, it became more apparent that, for instance, a book like Animal Farm, George Orwell's allegory of Stalinist Russia, speaks very much to our own time when democracy is under threat. A book like James Baldwin's If Beale Street Could Talk is about a young black man in the racial, uh, racially charged racist justice system. Written 60 years ago, it again could be written last week. So many of the books, even if they're written 50, 60, or 150 years ago, really do reflect what's going on in the culture and what's going on in the, uh, in the country today. And that's what great fiction does. It, so many of these 58 writers that I included were banned, mm -hmm. censored, some even burned in their lifetime and later. Um, we have to understand that reading is essential to the preservation of democracy. And one thing that I think is curious that I wanted to ask you about, because you're not just a curator in the sense that you're compiling all of these books, but you actually give, you know, the first line, the context about the author. And, and I'm just wondering why you feel that that is so relevant. Why not just present the books cold, if you will? Oh, well, I guess um, to me, the first lines is, are really important because- I pick my books by the first line. Yes, I don't know what that uh, says about me, but you got to bring me in. And with a short book, I think it becomes even more important. The words are so compressed. You have to, every word is so special in a short book. So the first lines are there to really grab us, even if it's something as simple as, where's Papa going with that ax, which is the first line of Charlotte's Web which people will say, oh, that's a children's book. Yes, it is a children's book, but it's a perfect book, and I read it almost every year, and I still weep when I read it. It's a perfectly written book by E.B. White. So what I wanted to do was not just present uh, the stories, and a little bit of biography of the authors to place them in, in their context. It's so important to understand. Before I let you go, favorite book of all time? 
Well, it's in there, uh, a portrait of the artist as a young man by James Joyce. It's the book that I think changed me. I, I believe it made me think I could be a writer, even though it took me a long time to understand that I could be a writer. It's about mythology, it's about writing, it's about discovering who you are, uh, and it's one of the greatest books of all time. Kenneth C. Davis, we thank you so much. We want to let our viewers know Great Short Books is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, he jumped in to help when a man had a heart attack at his restaurant, the touching reunion with that customer and the man he now calls a hero. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Finally tonight, a moment of gratitude for the first time since a terrifying night out to eat. A family in North Carolina was able to meet up with a restaurant worker who jumped into action when a man was having a heart attack while eating. Reporter Glenn Counts from our partner station WSOC was there for the reunion. Justin Jones has been in the food services industry for 14 years, and seven months ago, he was hired at Carolina Ale House in Waverly. It was just a, it was just a regular work day, just a regular nine to five. That's how uh, Jones describes the day good. when he saved a life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know what else to say. On November 1st, Robert Adams was at Carolina Ale. He's a regular and he went into cardiac arrest. I don't know what happened or what kicked in, but it was just like, you gotta help him. Jones was joined by two other men. Because he had CPR training, he coached them through it while talking to the 911 operator. Simple knowledge, uh, like CPR, uh, checking the pulse, you know, looking for vital signs. Hey! <laughs> Today, the Adams family came to the restaurant to thank Jones. Right. Not to blubber all over him. I'm so grateful, I don't know what to say. Like, that's what, that's what heroes look like. Well, I feel grateful that they were here at the right time, at the right moment. Seeing him actually upright instead of the condition I've seen him, that, that's, that's, that's satisfying. That's a, that's a blessing in itself. The family doesn't know who the other two guardian angels were, but they are not forgotten. Thank you. I don't know who you were. I don't know if you're even going to hear this, but thank you. Jones knows CPR, but the last time he took a course was 15 years ago. But he said it came right back to him. Um, I know I'm not a doctor or anything like that or paramedics, but hey, I know, I know the small things. I Such a heartfelt thank you there, and thank you so much for watching. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Before Columbine, Newtown, Parkland, 